You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. As always, I am your host, Elisa Jansen-Jones. And this episode is one of my very, very favorite subjects to talk about, money. Okay, not just like money or the philosophy of money or how to get money. And please don't think I'm evil because I think money is like valuable. Um, And this isn't really even a lesson on money per se, but we're going to talk about making extra money. And I'm not talking about fundraising for your program, but fundraising for you. Now, if you're like most music educators, the first check of the contract year is always an exciting time. Did you get a little raise for going up a level or did you start a new job or maybe you went from part-time to full-time? The number on your check determines what you get to do next and how you get to update your lifestyle over the next year. And for many music educators, one salary just isn't enough for the lifestyle we want to have. Or sometimes we may just feel like we want enough time or we have enough time outside of the classroom, we can turn that time into bonus income. Or in the summer, if we're off, we may just want to make a little extra cash on the side. In this episode, I bring on one of my favorite presenters, speakers, and fellow teachers who also happens to be an entrepreneur, a side hustleist, and music educator like myself, April Vargo. We will share with you some of the top ways music educators are taking on a little side hustle for some side cash. And as a bonus, we're going to talk about side hustles that could even become a second or follow-up career to teaching in the classroom. So whether you're part-time, full-time, all the time, or about done with, with this thinking, teaching thing time, there's something in this episode for you. But first, many of us here in the United States are just starting out the school year, and a lot of teachers are asking the important question, do we give a grade for at-home practice? I've been asking myself the same question. I'm done with paper in the classroom if I can avoid it. Since most students will pad their practice times and parents will corroborate with that, I mean, what's the point? Why don't we just grade on assessment, performing assessments? Won't that be just as effective motivation for those who are just in it for the grade anyway? Well, if you're thinking along the same lines, or maybe you're just tired of all the paperwork and paper associated with practice reports, you should take a look at what smart music can do for you. With smart music, you can create assignments for your students or assessments, if you will, and the student can get on and play for you. They'll get instant feedback on their performance and be motivated to practice it over and over again until they get it right. Smart music is great at gamifying the game of practice. Smart music is also flexible and can be used in almost any configuration you can imagine to support your curriculum. Check out their YouTube channel for video testimonials and see how teachers like you are taking advantage of the smart music curriculum resources now. While you're online, pop over to smartmusic.com and sign up for your teacher account. Now, let's get talking about making you a little more money with the side hustle. And of course, the first thing we covered was... A little introduction for April. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And I run a virtual school for the performing arts called Placing Act LLC, where I provide group and private lessons to musicians and actors, also uh, budding entrepreneurs and public speakers. And I do offer some different public speaking opportunities as well. So I have slowly started to expand the business. Um, My students are global. I have students in all 50 states, as well as international students in Canada and South Korea. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to miss people. But Australia, New Zealand. And it's, it's growing. So it's been so cool to be able to work with people in a global capacity. 
introduction out of the way, our first discussion was what may seem super obvious to some of us and totally hidden from others. And that is, how do I decide what to try as a side hustle? Most of us don't want to invest money in something that may or may not make us a big money in the return, right? So how do we choose? Well, here's what April and I suggest. Well, I think the biggest thing about a side hustle is it should be fun. It should be something that you enjoy doing. And a lot of people I personally know have taken their hobbies, something that they just do in their free time for fun, and they've turned it into a side hustle and and something sometimes that's incredibly lucrative and can be even more lucrative than their full-time job on on some occasions. So um, yeah, some of the lists I actually came up with was some of them are people that actually this is what they do. And I know when I was a kid, our teacher, our history teacher, he was into cabinet making. He loved woodworking and cabinet making. So every summer he would just make custom cabinetry. And he apparently had orders that the whole year built up and all summer he was totally booked with this, this side house, all this business. And it was, it was really cool. And that's, I think when it kind of stuck to me that I was like, wow, you can make something that you enjoy into something that actually makes money for you. Um, Some of the things I had come up with was the idea of a tour guide. If you live in a really cool touristy area or even an area where there's a big museum. I know we personally, my husband and I, were always going down to Nashville. And the Country Music Hall of Fame has so many different opportunities for people to engage. And you always, if you talk to some of the people that work there, they just love it. So they get involved and, and they help give tours. But you could also look at different tour companies, give a tour around your city. And especially for the summer when people are off and they're traveling, now this is something that you can kind of engage and show, hey, guess what? That's really cool in our in our area. If you're in nature, if you're a very outdoorsy person, you could even be a tour guide that, that takes people through the mountains or through you know, the waterways and things like that. So it's a really cool opportunity for you to kind of show the city or the area that you love to other people. At Sea Shops, people that create their own goods. I know Etsy is for vintage or homemade items. And this would be a way for all the crafters out there to be able to open up their own shop and sell some of their items. You can, or, you can even do that through Amazon too now. Like you can have an Yes. An Amazon fulfillment like shop. So anyway, to jump in there. Well, that's true too, because they've opened up a whole marketplace so that people can actually list their items. And I believe you can even list like your music too. So if you're a recording artist, you can actually sell some of your own works on there as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. People that are that so a seamstress there's always people that are looking for someone to take something in or shorten something or even just make them like wedding season is huge in the spring and summer. So, Hey, I need a dress to go to a wedding or I'm a bridesmaid and I really don't want to spend a bajillion dollars on my dress that I'm never, I mean, let's be honest, never going to wear again. So (laughs) go to somebody and you know, sewing is, is fabulous. The food industry, I know a lot of people that like to bake or they like to cook, so they get involved somehow in catering or in creating, again, sometimes beautiful cakes or or cupcakes are a thing, and just being able to provide that for people. Fitness instructor, yoga is fantastic, especially yoga in the park now. I mean, that's everywhere. So puppy again, yoga. Have you seen puppy I, yoga? I've been wanting to do puppy yoga. I have a Bashan poodle mix and I want to take him so bad. I just haven't done it yet. And our area doesn't have it. So I'll, I'll have to look probably deeper. Have you done it yet? Uh, no, no. I do. I do yoga almost every day though. Okay. Excellent. It's a lot of fun, but I am that puppy yoga. I know they're doing goat yoga too. <laughs> yeah, they just did that at our county fair. And I was like, really? Oh, well, okay. Okay. I mean, beer yoga, like, 
totally get into that too. So um, it's it's just funny how, yeah, I mean, yoga is a great example of like a passion that people have really capitalized on and, you know, you build your own crew and it's something that, that works out your body and your mind and is this holistic kind of approach to wellness and then turning it into something that's fun and creative and you can create a niche, right? Oh, absolutely. And you can make it whatever you want it to be. Like you just said, all those different examples of ways that you can kind of create your version of yoga. And people are so into that right now, too. Photographers. Photog- I, I love photography personally. But people that you're constantly taking pictures and people that have a good eye for those things and being able to offer your services as a freelance photographer is fantastic. Airbnb. I actually know somebody. I just talked to him the other day. He is a recording. He owns a recording studio. And part of his recording studio is also a bed and breakfast for the recording artists themselves. So if they come in from out of town, instead of having to try to find a place to stay, he offers part of it as like an Airbnb as well. It's like a package deal. I thought that was so cool. But if you have a secondary property or you even have a part in your own house that you would like to rent out. I've seen guest houses now being turned into like Airbnb suites. And then also like tiny houses. That's a really big deal is to get like a little tiny house. And and those things are like super expensive to stay in. It's fantastic. (laughs) The possibilities are really endless. And it gives you this opportunity to have a creative and cognitive outlet outside of your music teaching career. So it also helps you, you know, defeat that whole work-life balance thing that I I think a lot of music teachers struggle with. Um, Having a hobby and something that that gives you that secondary outlet and can create a little secondary income for you to alleviate some of the biggest complaints about being a music teacher. And I know a lot of us do school music teaching so that we have that consistent paycheck. And sometimes, you know, that's the only reason why we do it, unfortunately. But you know, having these secondary things can can really be a great uh, opportunity for us. Uh, I would say that in addition to, you know, doing whatever you're passionate about, if you're trying to think of something because you're like, well, I'm passionate about music, right? And we're going to get into some ideas for that too. Uh, but there, there's really only three industries ever in the, in the whole world. Everything can fit into like one of these three industries. There's manufacturing, so that's where you make something, right? There's retailing, that's where you sell, right? And then there's services. So like your yoga instructor, that's a service. You're selling on Etsy, that's manufacturing and retail. So I would say go through and think, is there anything that I can make that I can make with my hands and then either I can sell or other people can sell for me and then think, what can I just sell? Right. Uh, if, is there some product or something that somebody else makes that I can get and then turn over and, and sell at a markup? Uh, or is there a service that I can provide? You know, what do you really en- enjoy doing? I are where I live is, both half like super outdoorsy, like the tourism is all outdoor recreation. And then the other half is wine country, right? So I have this like vision of doing wine tours, like food and wine tours, uh, which it's a small enough town that you could spend a weekend and hit all the major hotspots, right? Uh, not be, and not be frustrated. Like, well, I only saw a fraction of the town. No, you're, you're going to get it all in a weekend. So, uh, <laughs> and then I'm a big, you know, outdoor outdoor buff too. I have a a trail blog and stuff on the side. So yeah, anyway, it's, it's, there's some really great ideas. Um, and I also advocate for, for two more things, um, having a niche and we didn't really talk about that preemptively, but how do you feel about, um, do you want to share what your thoughts are on what a niche kind of means and how that can be an advantage? Well, I guess I would look at a niche as something that is unique specifically to you. So not that, oh, I've seen all these other people make money. I'm going to jump on this bandwagon because uh, the public as a whole gets kind of over that whole, oh, good. It's another one of fill in the blank. So I think if you can do something that is truly unique or a spinoff of maybe even something that you know is, is popular, that is what is going to catch someone's attention. 
And a lot of times a niche might even be something that if you have friends and family that are constantly complimenting you on something that you're doing, like, God, you make the best cakes ever. And this is like amazing. Like your designs are fantastic. Sometimes that even helps you to find your niche is the thing that somebody's constantly complimenting you on or asking, can you do this for me? A lot of times, if, if you don't know what your niche is, sometimes just listening to people and their compliments could help you to kind of sort through that as well. Right. So a good example of that is when I uh, quit my full-time teaching job a decade ago, right? And I decided to open my own private lesson studio. And I didn't want to just teach French horn. That's my main instrument because my really good friend was like the French horn teacher in town, right? And she had this big, robust studio. And so I was like, you know, I'm not really going to go after her niche because I would be no competition, right? She already had this robust studio. It would be an uphill battle for me to try and recruit more horn students. And then it was the kind of the same deal with, with all the other instruments that I felt really good about teaching. And so I created myself a niche. I was like, what do I do better than anybody else? And the, it came down to, I can touch students not physically, <laughs> but, but I'm really great at working with students who have very specific challenges, right? So, so students who have failed with other teachers will find success with me because I'm really great at reading them and knowing what their specific needs are and breaking through those certain boundaries. So I ended up with students with physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities, emotional challenges. Um, so then that became my niche was like, I'll, I'll take the students who are not being successful anywhere else. Um, so a niche really is, what is it that you do that nobody else can do? And that's something that's so hard for people because you do exactly like you said, April, people, you see other people making money, you see other people's projects and you're like, oh my gosh, they're so great. But you would have to do it better or cheaper or faster than anybody else to be able to be super competitive in that niche. Um, and I don't know if you know this fun fact, my master's degree is in business administration and my emphasis was in management and strategy. So one of my side hustles is actually doing business strategy for people. So like this afternoon, I, I have a well. meeting with somebody who has this great idea for training people on how to talk politics, basically. Um, so I'm going to sit down with him and come up with, okay, what's your niche? Who are we reaching out to? And like developing this whole strategic plan. So anyway, that's my side hustle. Oh, that is so cool. Oh, that's neat. So the key to finding an awesome side hustle is fun. Do something fun that doesn't necessarily have to be music related. And in fact, for many of you, it might be better that it's not music related at all. But what if we don't want to do all of that work and we just want the money? Like, what if we spend some time during a school break to set something up to create that passive income for us? Well, let's talk about that now too. Passive income stream. So with your business, do you do recorded sessions or do you teach everything live? Um, I do offer, I did offer some recorded sessions and I do have curriculum that I've created that I do sell that has, it's beautiful because you create it, you put it up there and then you do forget about it because as far as you don't have to actively be available for people that want that that item. Um, a lot of it, I'll do that more now on request. So I don't have that as much because I find a lot of my time is taken doing more of my live gigs, but I do offer, yeah, passive income. And it is nice. Cause like you said, you put that out there and now you're not having to dedicate more time and you're still bringing money in. So for me, that's something that I'd like to keep growing in the future and something that I am working towards like this fall, hopefully starting to write a book. That was something that I really want to pursue. Awesome. Well, I am more than healthy, ha more than healthy to happy. <laughs> I'm more than happy to help you with the book writing stuff. I'll give you all the resources. And I got a lot of my Thank book you. writing resources from Steve Giddings too. So, um, anyway, we can, we can like do this whole little book writing mastermind, but a, a, some awesome. great, 
opportunities are our passive income resources or passive income sources. So if you can create something now that you don't have to babysit, right? Where you're not trading time for money, you're trading product for money, right? On, on a greater than one to one ratio. So sorry, I'm like getting all up in my, my business lingo here, but your recorded classes, your books, and this is why so many people get into teachers pay teachers, right? Cause you right. create this, this resource, this, um, lesson plan, right. Or these designs for your classroom decor or, you know, this project series packet or whatever. And then you put it on teachers pay teachers. And what do you do? You just kind of forget about it until somebody's like, Hey, I could really use a theme for my classroom. And then you like post it. Oh, Hey, I've got these great themes on teachers pay teachers. Right? So that's a great example of passive income. And I love the idea of passive income because it really does mean you do the work now and then you just reap the benefits, um, for the, for the rest of the time that that thing's available. So do consider as you're thinking about side hustle opportunities, which things that you can basically set it and forget it, right? Right. And time is your most important asset that you'll have. So the idea that you could free up your time to do things that you love is also really nice too. Yeah, spend spend all summer like getting all that stuff up on Teachers Pay Teachers or writing and publishing your book, and then all school year you just get a get a check, you know, whenever somebody buys something. So, I mean, it's not it's not huge money, but it's a it's a great little side hustle. And by next summer, maybe you have time to and money to take a vacation. So, it's good exactly. stuff. Exactly. I just loved talking side hustle with April. Heck. I like talking side hustle with just about anyone, which is why my consulting is my side hustle and so much fun. And remember that that's really what you're going for when deciding how to make a second income. If you're going to be spending your time doing it, make it fun for yourself. And if you just want the extra income without dedicating a bunch of your time regularly, then create something that generates passive income for you. Of course, our discussion of side hustle transitioned into second careers, starting your own business, or getting out of music education for a career that still lets us do music, but maybe not have to deal with unsupportive administration, or overly controlling parents, or lack of support and funding, or poorly behaved school children. Maybe you just want to have a regular job or something with less regulated hours. How do you even get started? Well, April and I, who have both started multiple businesses and are still music teachers, delved into that too. So tune back in for our next episode, where we share with you tips and tricks for second careers and how to become an entrepreneur without mortgaging your house or doing any of that scary stuff that most people have to go through when starting a new business. While you're waiting for that episode, why not pop on over to smartmusic.com, check out the show notes for this episode, which is episode 30, in case you're counting with us, and check out how they can help you eliminate practice records once and for all. Insert evil chuckle here. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast, give us a sweet rating, and tell a friend or two about us as well. Help us help support music educators all over the world. And if helping music educators all over the world is kind of your thing, perhaps you might be interested in being a presenter at the 2019 International Music Education Summit. The call for proposals has gone out, and if you're even thinking about it, then just do it. 2018 was crazy awesome success, and you want to be a part of it. Not only will you be able to help music educators, but you can do it right from your own home. You can also attend all of the sessions because as a presenter, your registration for the conference is 100% free. You also get all access to the online networking space, the teacher's lounge, and admission to all of the live streaming performances. So go to musicedsummit.org to submit your session proposal today. And I'll chat with you again in a couple of weeks. So until then, keep teaching on. Yeah.